Section one of a popular history of France, volume four. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. A popular history of France from the earliest times, volume four by Francois Guizot, translated by Robert Black. Chapter twenty eight. Francis the first and Charles the fifth, part one. The closer the study and the wider the contemplation a Frenchman bestows upon his country's history, the deeper will be his feelings of patriotic pride, dashed with a tinge of sadness. France, in respect of her national unity, is the most ancient amongst the states of Christian Europe. During her long existence she has passed through very different regimens, the chaos of barbarism, the feudal system, absolute monarchy, constitutional monarchy, and republicanism. Under all these regimens she has had no lack of greatness and glory, material power and intellectual luster, moral virtues and the charms of social life. Her barbarism had its Charlemagne, her feudal system Saint-Louis, Joan of Arc, and Bayard, her absolute monarchy Henry the Fourth and Louis the Fourteenth. Of our own times we say nothing. France has shown in war and in peace, through the sword and through the intellect. She has by turns conquered and beguiled, enlightened and troubled Europe. She has always offered to the foreigner a spectacle or an abode full of the curious and the attractive, of noble pleasures and of mundane amusements. And still, after so many centuries of such a grand and brilliant career, France has not yet attained the end to which she ever aspired, to which all civilized communities aspire, and that is, order in the midst of movement, security and liberty united and lasting. She has had shortcomings which have prevented her from reaping the full advantage of her merits. She has committed faults which have involved her in reverses. Two things, essential to political prosperity amongst communities of men, have hitherto been to seek in her, predominance of public spirit over the spirit of caste or of profession, and moderation and fixity in respect of national ambition, both at home and abroad. France has been a victim to the personal passions of her chiefs and to her own reckless changeability. We are entering upon the history of a period and a reign during which this intermixture of merits and demerits, of virtues and vices, of progress and backsliding, was powerfully and attractively exhibited amongst the French. Francis I, his government and his times, commenced the era of modern France, and bring clearly to view the causes of her greatnesses and her weaknesses. Francis I had received from God all the gifts that can adorn a man. He was handsome and tall and strong. His armor, preserved in the Louvre, is that of a man six feet high. His eyes were brilliant and soft. His smile was gracious. His manners were winning. From his very childhood he showed that he had wits, enterprise, skill, and boldness. He was but seven years old when, on the day of the conversion of St. Paul, January twenty fifth, 1501, about two p.m., my king, my lord, my Caesar, and my son was run away with, near Amboise, by a hackney which had been given him by Marshal de Guy, and so great was the danger that those who were present thought it was all over. Howbeit God, the protector of widowed women and the defender of orphans, seeing things to come, was pleased not to forsake me, knowing that, if accident had so suddenly deprived me of my love, I should have been too utter a wretch. Such is the account given of this little incident by his mother, Louise of Savoy, who was at that time habitually kept, by Anne of Brittany's jealousy, at a distance from Paris and the court. Some years later the young prince, who had become an ardent huntsman, took the fancy into his head one day to let loose in the courtyard of the castle of Amboise a wild boar, which he had just caught in the forest. The animal came to a door, burst it open with a blow of his snout, and walked up into the apartments. Those who were there took to their heels, but Francis went after the boar, came up with him, killed him with a sword thrust, and sent him rolling down the staircase into the courtyard. When, in 1513, Louis the Twelfth sent for the young Duke of Angoulême, and bade him go and defend Picardy against the English, Francis had scarcely done anything beyond so employing his natural gifts as to delight the little court of which he was the centre, an estimable trait, but very insufficient for the government of a people. When, two years afterwards, on the 1st of January, 1515, he ascended the throne before he had attained his one-and-twentieth year, it was a brilliant and brave but spoiled child that became king. He had been under the governance of Artus Gouffier, 
Sire de Boissy, a nobleman of Poitou, who had exerted himself to make his royal pupil a loyal knight, well trained in the moral code and all the graces of knighthood, but without drawing his attention to more serious studies or preparing him for the task of government. The young Francis d'Angoulême lived and was moulded under the influence of two women, his mother, Louise of Savoy, and his eldest sister, Marguerite, who, both of them, loved and adored him with passionate idolatry. It has just been shown in what terms Louise of Savoy, in her daily collection of private memoranda, used to speak to herself of her son, my king, my lord, my Caesar, and my son. She was proud, ambitious, audacious, or pliant at need, able and steadfast in mind, violent and dissolute in her habits, greedy of pleasure and of money as well as of power, so that she gave her son neither moral principles nor a moral example, for him the supreme kingship, for herself the rank, influence, and wealth of a queen-mother, and for both, greatness that might subserve the gratification of their passions. This was all her dream and all her aim as a mother. Of quite another sort were the character and sentiments of Marguerite de Valois. She was born on the 11th of April, 1492, and was, therefore, only two years older than her brother Francis. But her more delicate nature was sooner and more richly cultivated and developed. She was brought up with strictness by a most excellent and most venerable dame, in whom all the virtues, at rivalry with one another, existed together. As she was discovered to have rare intellectual gifts and a very keen relish for learning, she was provided with every kind of preceptors, who made her proficient in profane letters, as they were then called. Marguerite learned Latin, Greek, philosophy, and especially theology. At fifteen years of age, says a contemporary, the Spirit of God began to manifest itself in her eyes, in her face, in her walk, in her speech, and generally in all her actions. She had a heart, says Brantome, mightily devoted to God, and she loved mightily to compose spiritual songs. She also devoted herself to letters in her young days, and continued them as long as she lived, loving and conversing with, in the time of her greatness, the most learned folks of her brother's kingdom, who honored her so that they called her their Mycenaeus. Learning, however, was far from absorbing the whole of this young soul. She, says a contemporary, had an agreeable voice of touching tone, which roused the tender inclinations that are in the heart. Tenderness, a passionate tenderness, very early assumed the chief place in Marguerite's soul, and the first object of it was her brother Francis. When mother, son, and sister were spoken of, they were called a trinity, and to this Marguerite herself bore witness when she said, with charming modesty, Such boon is mine, to feel the amity that God hath putten in our trinity, wherein to make a third, I, all unfitted, to be that number's shadow, am admitted. Marguerite it was for whom this close communion of three persons had the most dolorous consequences. We shall fall in with her more than once in the course of this history, but, whether or no, she was assuredly the best of this princely trio, and Francis I was the most spoiled by it. There is nothing more demoralizing than to be an idol. The first acts of his government were sensible and of good omen. He confirmed or renewed the treaties or truces which Louis the Twelfth, at the close of his reign, had concluded with the Venetians, the Swiss, the Pope, the King of England, the Archduke Charles, and the Emperor Maximilian, in order to restore peace to his kingdom. At home, Francis I maintained at his council the principal and most tried servants of his predecessor, amongst others the finance minister, Florimond Robertet, and he raised to four the number of the marshals of France, in order to confer that dignity on Bayard's valiant friend, James of Chabin, lord of La Palice, who, even under Louis the Twelfth, had been entitled by the Spaniards the great marshal of France. At the same time he exalted to the highest offices in the state two new men, Charles, Duke of Bourbon, who was still a mere youth, but already a warrior of renown, and Anthony du Prat, the able premier minister of the Parliament of Paris, the former he made constable, and the latter chancellor of France. His mother, Louise of Savoy, was not unconcerned, it is said, in both promotions. She was supposed to feel for the young constable something more than friendship, and she regarded the veteran magistrate, not without reason, as the man most calculated to unreservedly subserve the interests of the kingly power and her own. These measures, together with the language and the behavior of Francis I, 
and the care he took to conciliate all who approached him, made a favorable impression on France and on Europe. In Italy especially, princes as well as people, and Pope Leo X before all, flattered themselves, or were pleased to appear as if they flattered themselves, that war would not come near them again, and that the young king had his heart set only on making Burgundy secure against sudden and outrageous attacks from the Swiss. The aged king of Spain, Ferdinand the Catholic, adopting the views of his able minister, Cardinal Ximenes, alone showed distrust and anxiety. "'Go not to sleep,' he said to his former allies. "'A single instant is enough to bring the French in the wake of their master, whithersoever he pleases to lead them. Is it merely to defend Burgundy that the king of France is adding fifteen hundred lances to his men-at-arms, and that a huge train of artillery is defiling into Lyonnais, and little by little approaching the mountains?' Ferdinand urged the Pope, the Emperor Maximilian, the Swiss, and Maximilian Sforza, Duke of Milan, to form a league for the defense of Italy, but Leo X persisted in his desire of remaining or appearing neutral, as the common father of the faithful. Meanwhile the French ambassador at Rome, William Bude, a man, says Giacardini, of probably unique erudition amongst the men of our day, and besides a man of keen and sagacious intellect, was unfolding the secret working of Italian diplomacy, and sending to Paris demands for his recall, saying, "'Withdraw me from this court full of falsehoods. This is a residence too much out of my element.' The answer was that he should have patience, and still negotiate, for France, meeting ruse by ruse, was willing to be considered hoodwinked, whilst the eyes of the Pope, diverted by a hollow negotiation, were prevented from seeing the peril which was gathering round the Italian League, and its declared or secret champions. Neither the king nor the pope had for long to take the trouble of practicing mutual deception. It was announced at Rome that Francis I, having arrived at Lyon in July 1515, had just committed to his mother, Louise, the regency of the kingdom, and was pushing forward towards the Alps an army of sixty thousand men and a powerful artillery. He had won over to his service Octavian Fregoso, Doge of Genoa, and Bartholomew d'Alvagno, the veteran general of his allies the Venetians, was encamped with his troops within hail of Verona, ready to support the French in the struggle he foresaw. Francis I, on his side, was informed that twenty thousand Swiss, commanded by the Roman, Prosper Colonia, were guarding the passes of the Alps in order to shut him out from Milanes. At the same time he received the news that the Cardinal of Sion, his most zealous enemy in connection with the Roman Church, was devotedly employing, with the secret support of the Emperor Maximilian, his influence and his preaching for the purpose of raising in Switzerland a second army of from twenty to five and twenty thousand men, to be launched against him, if necessary, in Italy. A Spanish and Roman army, under the orders of Don Raymond de Cardon, rested motionless at some distance from the Po, waiting for events and for orders prescribing the part they were to take. It was clear that Francis I., though he had been but six months king, was resolved and impatient to resume in Italy, and first of all, in Milanese, the war of invasion and conquest which had been engaged in by Charles the Eighth and Louis the Twelfth, and the league of all the states of Italy save Venice and Genoa, with the Pope for their half-hearted patron, and the Swiss for their fighting men, were collecting their forces to repel the invader. It was the month of August. The snow was diminishing and melting away among the Alps, and the king, with the main body of the army, joined at Embrun the constable de Bourbon, who commanded the advance guard. But the two passes of Mount Cenis and Mount Ginevra were strongly guarded by the Swiss, and others were sought for a little more to the south. A shepherd, a chamois hunter, pointed out one whereby, he said, the mountains might be crossed, and a descent made upon the plains of the Marquisate of Saluso. The young constable went in person to examine the spots pointed out by the shepherd, and the statement having been verified, it did not seem impossible to get the whole army over, even the heavy artillery, and they essayed this unknown road. At several points, abysses had to be filled up, temporary bridges built, and enormous rocks pierced. The men-at-arms marched on foot, with great difficulty dragging their horses, with still greater difficulty the infantry hauled the cannon over holes, incompletely stopped, and fragments of yawning rock. Captains and soldiers set to work together. No labor seems too hard to eager hope, and in five days the mountain was overcome, 
and the army caught sight of the plain where the enemy might be encountered. A small body of four hundred men-at-arms, led by Marshal de Chabin, were the first to descend into it, and among them was Bayard. Marshal, said he to Chabin, we are told that over the Po yonder is Sir Prosper Colonna, with two thousand horse, in a town called Villafranca, apprehending naught and thinking of naught but gaudies. We must wake up his wits a little, and this moment get into the saddle with all our troops, that he might not be warned by any. Sir Bayard, said the marshal, it is right well said, but how shall we cross the river Po, which is so impetuous and broad? Sir, said Bayard, here is my lord de Moret's brother, who knows the ford. He shall cross first, and I after him. So they mounted their horses, crossed the Po, and were soon there, where Sir Prosper Colonna was at table and was dining, as likewise were all his folk. Bayard, who marched first, found the archers on guard in front of the Italian leader's quarters. Yield you, and utter no sound, cried he, else you are dead, men. Some set about defending themselves. The rest ran toward Colonna, saying, Up, sir, for here are the French in a great troop already at this door. Lads, said Colonna to them, keep this door a little till we get some armor on to defend ourselves. But whilst the fighting was going on at the door, Bayard had the window scaled, and entering first cried out, Where are you, Sir Prosper? Yield you, else you are a dead man. Sir Frenchman, who is your captain? asked Colonna. I am, sir. Your name, Captain. Sir, I am one Bayard of France, and here are the Lord of La Palice, and the Lords d'Aubigny and d'Imbercourt, the flower of the captains of France. Colonna surrendered, cursing fortune, the mother of all sorrow and affliction, who had taken away his wits, and because he had not been warned of their coming, for he would at least have made his capture a dear one. And he added, It seems a thing divinely done, four noble knights at once, with their comrades at their backs, to take one Roman noble. Francis I and the main body of his army had also arrived at the eastern foot of the Alps, and were advancing into the plains of the country of Saluzzo and Piedmont. The Swiss, dumbfounded at so unexpected an apparition, fell back to Navarra, the scene of that victory which two years previously had made them so proud. A rumor spread that negotiation was possible, and that the question of Milanese might be settled without fighting. The majority of the French captains repudiated the idea, but the king entertained it. His first impulses were sympathetic and generous. "'I would not purchase,' said he to Marshal de Lautrec, "'with the blood of my subjects, or even with that of my enemies, what I can pay for with money.' Parleys were commenced, and an agreement was hit upon with conditions on which the Swiss would withdraw from Italy and resume alliance with the French. A sum of seven hundred thousand crowns, it was said, was the chief condition and the king and the captains of his army gave all they had, even to their plate, for the first installment which Lautrec was ordered to convey to Bafalora, where the Swiss were to receive it. But it was suddenly announced that the second army of twenty thousand Swiss, which the Cardinal of Sion had succeeded in raising, had entered Italy by the valley of the Ticino. They formed a junction with their countrymen. The Cardinal recommenced his zealous preaching against the French. The newcomers rejected the stipulated arrangements, and confident in their united strength, all the Swiss made common accord. Lautrec, warned in time, took with all speed his way back to the French army, carrying away with him the money he had been charged to pay over. The Venetian general, Daviano, went to the French camp to concert with the king measures for the movements of his troops, and on both sides nothing was thought of but the delivery of a battle. End of section 1